All right. Yay. All right. Doors Doors are closed. Let the games begin. <laughs> no, I don't know. All right. So um, I'm Brian Furman, and we also have... Bo Bullock. I'm Derek Banks. Yep. Today we're going to uh, talk about the, uh, the Cred Defense Toolkit uh, that we put together for you guys. And so, of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about us. Uh, we are all primarily pen testers at uh, Black Hills Information Security, a bunch of certs and things you guys probably don't really care about. Uh, these two guys are part of uh, some pretty awesome organizations. Uh, I don't live in either of these states, but if you guys do, definitely check these uh, organizations out. Um, we also have uh, Bo with Tradecraft Security Weekly. If you haven't seen any of his episodes yet, check those out as well. Things are freaking amazing. Um, what's up? So, thanks, man. Yeah, no problem, man. <laughs> and we also uh, have uh, with these two the Hacker Dialogues podcast, which just started up recently. And I believe we're going to be doing an episode tonight? Yeah. Tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. yeah probably somewhere. tonight. Yeah, somewhere. So check that out as well. And Owa? I don't know. Anyone in here like Owa? Yes. Yeah, yeah exactly. All right. <laughs> so a lot of times with pen tests, our clients are asking us, um, you know, we saw what you guys did. We saw some of the tools you guys use. But what can we do to help prevent this? How can we make your guys' job harder? And so a lot of our post-exploitation activities, when, once we run a network, we kind of have a, a, something we revolve around. So I mean, we're using a lot of built-in tools within the Windows environment. And really, what we're, what we're focused on, we like to call credential abuse. One way or another, we're trying to get a hold of credentials. We're trying to escalate up our privileges, uh, trying to move throughout an environment. And a lot of that revolves around uh, getting credentials, different ways to do that. So with this talk, Really what we're, what we're looking at and what we're going to uh, go over, basically uh, some, some different tools that we put together, some different configurations you can set up in your environment to try to make it harder for us to do this. Things that if we run into in your environment, we're going to say, well, crap, <laughs> this sucks, but it becomes fun. All this is free, so we are not charging a dime for this. We do not expect anything uh, out of this other than for people to uh, get the setup in their environments and make things a little bit harder for maybe everyone help, else. And maybe help us code it. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> that would be awesome. Any, any help we yeah, can get, we will, we will take it. So we're in an environment. You got in. What are we going to do now? One of the first things we'll look at is basically trying to guess people's passwords. Your environment is only as strong as your weakest password in the environment. And what we can do typically is once we get a couple credentials, we'll try and we'll use those accounts to get more credentials, try to get access to more systems, and move on until we ultimately get control over your environment or hit our target on the environment. Some of the things we can, other things we can do is we can do Kerber roasting. Anyone familiar with Kerber roasting attacks? If not, check it out. It is the bomb. And basically, you can get a service account hashes. You can take those hashes offline, try to crack them, and hopefully uh, get a password and Move on up. Other things, uh, LLM and R poisoning. Anyone ever used Responder before? Something like that? Yeah? All right. It's also, whoop, whoop. <laughs> All right. Also something uh, pretty, pretty effective and uh, pretty gnarly. So again, what, we're, what we have here, Cred Defense Toolkit, basically it's, it's both tools and different techniques that you can use to both deter people from doing this, so prevent them from doing these types of attacks, and in the case where you're not preventing them from doing the attack, at least being able to detect that people have done these attacks. So one of the first things we'll talk about is the password filter. And yeah, what's up? All right. So the password filter. I like the enthusiasm. Yeah, that was awesome. Yes. We need more of that. Yeah. <laughs> Just like everything I say, password auditing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. You got <laughs> centralized login. <laughs> I like this. Yeah, me too. You guys are you, you guys are awesome. All right. So, uh, scanner. <laughs> All right. So basically, with with the password filter, um, we're going to, going to be trying to. Um, prevent people from using these poor passwords all together. Uh, different iterations of, you know, summer and spring, all that stuff. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Auditing. So you have the password filter in place, but what do you do about passwords that are already in place? Um, 
Well, we can audit that. We can try to find weak passwords. We can also try to find different configuration issues that if an attacker finds those, they're going to be pretty excited. Uh, additionally, we talk about uh, centralized logging. So how can you collect the Windows event logs to a central place, get them all forwarded, and try to parse through them to look for things like password spraying attacks, um, Kerber hosting, other things of that nature. Uh, and Responder, if someone's running Responder on your network, how can you find that and go over all that? So the framework we put together, and I'm going to just be up front, I'm not a GUI designer, and we are not by any means, so I mean, it's, <laughs> I'm not saying it's pretty. If someone wants to come up with a sweet logo, I would say that's step one. Yeah, Please sure. make us a sweet logo. <laughs> we'll put it on there. <laughs> um, but this is kind of the interface you'll be presented with if you, if you pop up the, the GUI portion. You don't have to use the GUI portion for all this, but uh, it's there for some of it. So uh, Windows Presentation Foundation kind of forms the GUI. Uh, C Sharp, PowerShell, and uh, are uh, kind of the coding that we're using in the background, and it definitely is a work in progress. So if you go and look at it and you're just like, what the f is this you're going through? No worries, that's normal. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, alpha release. All right, that's password cool. auditing. Woo! Yeah! All right. It's going to get old after a bit. <laughs> no, it won't. Yeah. It won't yeah. Get old. <laughs> no. All right. So with password auditing, like I said, we're attempting to basically find uh, passwords in the environment, weak passwords that are already set. Uh, if we can guess them, then attackers can guess them too. Uh, insecure password attributes, um, different uh, configurations you basically got set up. And we're gonna go, I'm going to go into this all a little bit more in uh, detail in a couple of the slides. And also password reuse. So basically, um, people who have uh, two accounts, you know, a domain administrator account and a normal user account, are they using the same password for both of them? Do you have, uh, you know, 20 accounts in your environment that all use the same password? If you could find that stuff, you probably want to check that out. So, weak passwords. Um, <laughs> yeah, shit's weak. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, what season is it? I bet if you ask any pen tester, they will immediately tell you, oh, yeah, and they probably know in both hemispheres as well. <laughs> so, um, do you... And, uh, but do, do you need a custom password or custom built cracker to find these? No, you actually don't. And I'll show you. Um, this works pretty spiffy. Um, company spirit. <laughs> so basically, are people using their company name and some iteration of that for their password? Yeah, we can find all that. Um, insecure password distributes. So do you have passwords that aren't expiring? Accounts that don't have any password. Do you have accounts that have landman hashes enabled? Um, do you have passwords that are stored in clear text within the environment? That's a thing. Um, do you have administrator delegation uh, rights set for accounts? Password reuse, widespread local admin. I mean, in environments where this is, uh, where this is in place, if, if we get one of those administrator accounts, it is game over, <laughs> in, um, almost just like that. Um, shared network accounts, so basically, do you have one account that multiple people with the environment are using? Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, domain administrators are using their password for their domain user account. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is our, their auditing tool, so finding those weak passwords. This is an adaptation of DS Internals, um, Michael Grafnetter. He's out of uh, Czech Republic, uh, pretty cool dude. And what this does is basically uh, leverages the AD replication sync feature, and, uh, but it isn't writing any of the, uh, the data to the disk. And with this, uh, within the toolkit, just a couple clicks, and you are off and running. So basically, you pop up this interface. Um, you can select the password auditing feature. And you'll get a list of all the domains within your forest. So if you want to perform it on a different domain than what you're on, you can potentially do that, right? You have the credentials for that. Next, go ahead and select your target. You'll get a list of domain controllers in that environment. Go ahead and select the domain controller that you want to use to target. And next, you can go ahead and select your password file that you would like to use for password cracking. So I think in this example here, I have the Rocky list. But when we go to see the statistics, it's actually going to be for the human readable crack station list. Um, if you want to make your own list, you can do that too. Um, it's fine. You can go ahead and choose uh, the save file for your output and run the audit. After you run the audit, you'll get a nice little output like this. Uh, so you can go through. You can see accounts where password hasn't expired, uh, accounts with uh, the admin uh, delegation turned on, password's not required. Um, you also see things uh, under the uh, users with uh, that NT hash. That's uh, all the accounts that are, have a hash that matches that. Uh, it's basically password reuse, um, that telling you if it, uh, if it cracked passwords, who's using that password. And then down on the bottom, you'll get some more statistics. So what was the password file, total time in seconds, and a couple other statistics there. So on a machine that was uh, at two cores, it was a virtual machine with two cores, eight gigs of RAM, uh, running the human-readable crack station uh, 
list. It took about 91 seconds to perform this entire audit on a domain with, I think, three domain controllers and over 30,000 users. So it's, I mean, it's quick. You, you can do this. You do not have to have a custom-built rig, necessarily. You're not going to get all the passwords, but, I mean, you can, you can at least do a quick check. Is there a question? One at a time, yeah. So right now it's not a feature to, to cross-reference the, the stats, but that would be an excellent feature to add in later. Very cool. Like it. All right, password filter. You guys are bored? <laughs> 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 All right, so let's talk, let's talk about password complexity. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the standard Windows uh, complexity. So you got eight character minimum. You have to have three of the four following, uppercase, lowercase, special, numeric. Change it every 90 days. What meets this? And what do we find often where this is the only policy in place? Well, people pick current season, current year. Uh, they'll pick month, day, year that the password was set. So they, you know, they'll just like, hey, this is the date that I have to set it. So let's just go ahead and set my password to that date. I have definitely found that a couple of times. And uh, other things, just using the company name. So we can do things like increase the length requirements. So we can move up from, you know, an eight character minimum to a 15 character minimum. And we still highly suggest that, highly recommend that. When we hit environments where it's a 15 character minimum, the success that we have in guessing passwords drops drastically. It becomes hard. It doesn't mean that we don't get any. We definitely, definitely still do, but the number that we get is, it goes way down. So we still recommend that. But what about users doing things like just doubling down? Like, oh, summer 2017 doesn't work? Well, how about summer, summer 2017? Maybe put on an exclamation point and do things like that. So how do we get rid of that? Well, there's a Windows password filter tool. And uh, there's a little graph kind of on the, uh, uh, the process for when you change your password, what happens. Now, there are commercial tools that exist. You can go on, you can buy tools if you'd like to. But again, we wanted to do something free. There are open source tools. And what this work is based off of is the Open Password Filter Project. It's an adaptation of that. Um, great thing, great, uh, definitely great basis to work off of. But we wanted something that's a little bit easier to deploy, configure, update, manage, all that good stuff. And so that's what we put together here. And you can quickly, easily deploy this to all the domain controllers in your environment. So that's, that is one thing. With a password filter, it needs to be installed on all the domain controllers who are running the Active Directory role. Um, but we make that pretty easy for you. We make it even easier to, if you want to update your list and deploy that out. So you can also do this in, uh, the other feature we've added is this case, it's case insensitive. So you don't need to write out all the different cases of the passwords. It also does substring matching instead of direct matching. So you don't have to put in all the iterations of winter, summer, all that stuff. Just put in the word and it'll pick out if they use, you know, winter, winter, 2017, whatever. It'll find that. So to install, uninstall, basically just pop up the GUI, select the password filter option. Uh, if you want to go ahead and install, what it'll do is it'll go and it'll grab uh, down a list of all the domain controllers in your environment. It'll go and it'll look at the registry, see if the uh, password filter has been installed. If it hasn't been installed, it ends up in the unconfigured column. If it is installed, it's in the installed column. If you want to go ahead and install, yep, so if you want to go ahead and install, you basically just click on the DC, click install. It'll uh, deploy everything over to it, and it'll ask if you want to restart it. Um, for when you're first installing it, it does require a domain controller restart. Um, so you'll probably want to do that one by one, which is why we put this uh, tool together here. But after it's installed, um, if you want to do, I mean, you can go and you can uninstall it, which it'll go, it'll just remove the key, restart the DC, you're good to go. After it's installed, though, if you want to update the list, um, you can go ahead, you can use that feature, which is part of the toolkit as well. Uh, just, it'll show you all the domain controllers for which this is configured. And uh, just go ahead and click edit passwords. It'll pop up this little notepad thing for you. Um, and you can go, this is the default list we put together. Definitely feel free to add to it, uh, whatever you think should be in there. But you can go and you can edit these, remove, add, whatever. And after you're done, you can deploy the update. And it will automatically deploy this list to all the domain controllers on which the password filter is configured and running. And that does not require a restart. So once you've got it installed, you can update the passwords as frequently as you would like without any restart. And you are good to go. With that, I'm going to pass it off. You guys aren't excited about consolidating endpoints? Uh, cool. Just wanted to make sure because, you know, I, I get really excited about consolidating my log files. Um, so how many of you guys knew that there was a native way in a Windows environment to do this? Uh, Windows Event Forwarder? Well, that's better than I thought. That most people seem to have no idea that you can actually do this in, in, in Windows. And so. Usually our customers, we find one of two scenarios. Uh, usually they're not logging anything. And, yeah. 
<laughs> and so they have no way, even if they wanted to, to find out what we're doing. Uh, and then uh, the, the other scenario is, is uh, they're taking every log in their environment and they're shoving it into a sim because their sim vendor told them to do that because their sim vendor charges them for how much they ingest. So, you know, so really that's not the way to log. Uh, in either case, it's our experience that uh, we, we go unnoticed, either because we blend into all the noise or, you know, they're just not looking to begin with. So, like I said, uh, you can use Windows Event Forwarder and take all of your Windows endpoints and have them log specific events to, or we could do all, I don't recommend that, but log specific events to a central location so then you can, you know, do analysis on that. And so then from the, the Windows forwarder, you can send it to something like Elk and make a DIY sim. And here's an eye chart for you of how this actually works. Yeah, sorry, there's a lot of moving parts. But the gist of it is, is that through GPOs, you configure uh, the Windows event forwarder uh, setup. Uh, it, the, the machines that are subscribed to, the, uh, to, to send their logs to the Windows event forwarder server uh, do it without putting an agent on the endpoint. Uh, it uses uh, Windows uh, Remote Management. And so, yeah, it, you could do a whole talk on this. Though so I have a blog post that describe exactly step by step how to set this up, and it'll be on our blog by the end of the day. And I, I, I couldn't just go through the whole setup uh, during this talk, or they would never get to talk. It would be the whole, whole time, right? <clears throat> but, uh, oh, sorry. But like I said, you don't want to send everything to your, your consolidated uh, endpoint. You want to send specific tactical data. Um, a good place to start is the Sysmon spotting the adversary list, or NSA spotting the adversary list, uh, and then also I recommend Sysmon and PowerShell. But wait, so why am I talking about logs when we're talking about Credential Guard? The, the reason is you want to get all of your account activity into one place so that you can do analysis on it. Uh, then you, if all your log or all your account and authentic authentication and group activity are going to one place, then you can ask your environment questions about who is authenticating where. Uh, you can set up honey accounts, so if a specific account logs in, uh, you, you'll know, uh, which will be important here in just a minute. Things like failed login frequency, or even better yet, uh, who's logging in where, uh, because you know, Sally from accounting shouldn't be logged into 27 machines, right? At least not normally, I would think. Yeah, uh, that, that's true. Uh, and so, like I said, once everything's in one place, uh, that architecture, the architecture allows for you to do analysis on that Windows machine using PowerShell or, or C Sharp, like we're doing, and then also uh, into Kibana. If you've never used Kibana, all this data going in one place where you can just ask questions is something we'd like all of our customers to do, because then you can find us. So we were talking about Kerber roasting just a minute ago. Wait. So again, uh, there have been whole conference talks given on what Kerber roasting is. So in a nutshell, uh, any domain user can query your environment for accounts that are running services, specifically uh, SQL, IIS, that's what we see really commonly. Uh, SQL is probably the most common. And the reason this works is because there's a service principal name that's associated with this service, or the account rather. And um, when you request a Kerberos ticket or request to log in with Kerberos, uh, uh, there's a, a portion of the, the, uh, the TGS ticket that's encrypted with the account's uh, NTLM hash. So effectively, any user in your environment can get a Kerberos ticket and take it offline to crack for as long as they want, right? I mean, they can do it for months and eventually get a password. So again, like Brian was saying, we recommend that you have long, complicated passwords, but I mean, if I get six years to crack it, I've actually seen SQL accounts that their password hasn't changed in, well, ever. Um, so if anyone can crack it and have, have the resources to do it, uh, that's a problem, right? So turns out when uh, you when you request a Kerberos ticket, it's actually logged on the domain controller. Um, so what you can do is you create a fake SPN, a Honey Token account. It's real easy to do, uh, but make sure you don't duplicate uh, an actual service in your domain, because uh, then 
yeah, users are going to call because they won't be able to get to uh, whatever service they're trying to get to. But your users won't go to the fake one because, well, and, and unless it's Sally from accounting, because yeah, she's she's balling, right? Um, <laughs> so, so why do why would we do this? Uh, so, event four seven six nine records any success or failure, and so if I ever see that Honey Token account uh, request, I know that somebody's actually curb roasting. Right, so uh, we have a PowerShell script that we wrote that can be run in two ways. You can run it specifically on the forwarded events EVTX file, or you can run it in a loop, and it'll sit there and monitor on the Windows event for this. It's made to run on the the, the consolidated server, and uh, anytime somebody runs a Kerber roasting attack, uh, it, it'll show up. Right, and yeah. so. And, and by the way, sorry for the IP address format. That's actually how it shows up in the log. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah, that's the IPv6 representation of an IPv4 address. And that's how it shows up in the log. Isn't that awesome? So I left it that way because I didn't feel like splitting it because that's really what the log file says. But thanks, Microsoft. So. Password spraying! <laughs> I am pretty sure that it's a rule at Black Hills that if you do any talk whatsoever, we have to talk about password spraying. It's like, it's a thing. It's like our, obviously our favorite thing because we do it all the time. Um, so password spraying, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is essentially the opposite of what brute forcing a single account would be. So you have a list of users from a domain, you're trying one password for all of them. So you avoid lockouts, right? Um, so this is something, like I said, we use it on pretty much, I don't know, every single engagement. Like I don't know if there's, Internal and external. Um, this is a tool uh, that it's a PowerShell tool that I wrote called Domain Password Spray um, that we use internally and have very good success with. I mean, there's plenty of times where we're doing an assessment where we try summer 2017 or or spring 2017 and get you know like 30 creds. Um, and you know, one of the reason, or I mean, even more than that. I mean, we've I don't know probably like I've had customers where we get like hundreds of creds. Yeah. Um, and so like, you know, you say like, all right, so what do you need that many creds for? I mean, it's, it's access, right? Because different people have different permissions in an environment to access different things. And so now you go run Bloodhound and find, you know, that you have like this one user you got a cred for that has access to the system over here. Anyways, like the, the fact is that it's just really useful. And especially outside of an organization. So we talked about OA earlier. Um, so it's another tool uh, that we wrote at Black Hills called Mail Sniper. Um, you can use that externally to do password spraying against OA, O365. Um, and again, like you do your recon, get a list of users, um, and then try one password externally. And a lot of times we're successful externally as well. And like, so what, what's the point in that, right? Well, now I have access to email. Um, and now I can, you know, search for, I mean, if they're in O365 environment, I have access to SharePoint, I have access to a bunch of other stuff. Um, so we, we might be able to go look for VPN info at that point. Um, so, uh, the fact is, is that no matter where your password's going, it's going to create failed login attempts, right? Or failed login events. So if you're, um, if you're looking at events on your DC coming from like OA logins, um, you, you could easily identify that it's coming from like a single IP unless, you know, you're using something like proxy cannon and, and, you know, pivoting through thousands of IPs. But internally, um, it's, it's probably a bad thing if a single system is generating, I don't know, more than 10 failed login attempts. I mean, this is, you can gauge that in an hour. Like, let's say that I, I generate 10 failed login attempts from a single IP in an hour. It's probably a bad thing. Um, so what we we did with uh, the script that he mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a parser that basically just looks at the event logs and says, hey, oh, in the last hour, did anyone generate 10 failed login attempts? Um, or any any specific host generate 10 failed login attempts? And we'll alert you to it, you know? Because um, again, like, this is one of those things that we're, Super successful with. Um, this is what it kind of looks like right now on the, uh, on the server side when we, when we run the parser. He mentioned, you know, we can run it in a loop, um, and it will just, you know, alert you whenever it sees password spring. So this is, again, one of those things that's like, you know, the logs are there. Why not alert on somebody doing this, you know? And that's one of the things that we wanted to do. Um, responder guard? Responder! So, Responder Guard is a tool um, that will allow you to find Responder on your network. Um, so there are a couple other uh, tools already out there that kind of do this. Um, but I mean, so I guess let me back up. So NBNS and LLM and our spoofing is, is 
I, I guarantee you every pen tester in the room has done this. This is, you get on, onto a network and you do this and you, like, I, I don't know, 99% of the time you're going to get hashes. Um, because you are basically saying, hey, let me, let me respond to somebody trying to authenticate to something like, a, like an SMB share. Um, and so you can, you can end up spoofing, uh, invalid post names and, uh, direct people to basically hit your SMB server, at which point you'll get into LMV2 hashes or, um, you can actually use it to like relay to other, other hosts on the network. Um, you don't even have to crack the, the hash at that point. Um, so again, like how do you detect this on a network? So there are some other tools that are, that are already out there. There's a few different free ones. I think there's actually a couple commercial ones too, um, that attempt to find respond around our network. And, uh, from what I could gather, um, you know, a few of them have issues with scanning beyond the, the single subnet that it's already on. Um, so with, with how NBNS works, um, and LLMNAR, they're meant to just be like a broadcast protocol on the local LAN you're running it on. Um, so like if I, if I broadcast the packet, it's just going to hit every host on my, my LAN. Um, so a lot of the tools just use that. And so you'd have to basically run it on every subnet that you have on your network. And that's kind of troublesome. Um, the other thing is uh, a lot of them are written in Python. We wanted to in implement more of like a PowerShell approach to this. Um, I've seen uh, a couple tools where they use, uh, like the, the technique is basically they're like almost like doing like a honey token kind of thing where they're just broadcasting authentication attempts to every single host or every single IP address. Um, and then, you know, somebody would have to go crack that hash and then attempt to log in. And if they did, that'd be, you know, like evident that somebody was running a responder. But again, like that doesn't really alert you the second that it, it detects responder. So I wanted something where we could alert immediately and scan everything. So that's what this, this, it's PowerShell script can do. Um, and you know, we implemented it into, uh, cred defense, but at the same time, you can run this as a standalone PowerShell script. Um, if you just want to like start looking on your network, um, go grab this PowerShell script. And basically what you can do is give it a list of CIDR ranges. Um, and basically it'll just, it'll generate the list of every IP from the CIDR ranges, um, and then attempt literally to hit every single host. It'll, it'll do an NBNS request to every single host in your list. And if anything responds to it, cause it's, it's generating a, a, uh, an invalid host name, if anything responds to it, that's Responder on your network. Um, so I, I've tested it with Responder, I've tested it with Inve. Um, seems to work. Um, again, like, you know, that's one of those things, like, we, we have been, like, literally last week was, I don't know, we were working on this so hard because, you know, life happens. We were, you know, had travel for a couple weeks and a hurricane came through and knocked some power out. Um, but other than, you know, like, we, we want, we wanted this to be, as useful as possible, but again, like, I mean, I've tested it. Um, I, I, if you find issues and it doesn't work for you, please help me, let me know, because I want this, I want this as a thing. Like, I want to be able to detect responder on network, because again, it's one of those things that a lot of pen testers do. Um, so, uh, the other cool thing about this specific, uh, tool is it immediately writes to the Windows event log on the system it's running on. So, uh, you can actually, implement it into any sim really easily. So it writes a custom event log, it's uh, 8415. Um, and if you see that, you know, in your sim or, or in cred defense, um, if you're, if you're running it with cred defense, then it'll alert you that, that, uh, that you have that event. Um, and then additionally, it has honey token capability too, because I, I thought that would be an, a nice additional thing. Like, all right, so like, let's say that you responded um, or you saw a responder on the network responder, uh, now, now it has a hash for a user, honey token user. Let's say like, I don't know, like they may, might have had like a Dropbox running responder or something and then they went and grabbed it. So I didn't have time to actually like, you know, de figure out where they were exactly. But I detected them, you know, with the first NBNS request. But, you know, they could take that hash offline now and then go crack it, make it super easy, like summer 2017. Um, and, and then, uh, and then, um, you know, whenever they go to log in again, like let's say they, you know, do try to do a physical attack at that point and come walk into a building and try to log in. There you go. You have another alerting mechanism. Um, and it, it looks more legit too, right? I mean, if, if I am running responder and I see something respond to it, like legit actually try to log in now and I get their NTL and V2 hash, that just seems a little bit more realistic. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like on the scanner side. Um, I, it does need some work on some multi-threading. So, uh, if anyone is a PowerShell multi-threading expert, that'd be awesome. Um, but right now it's, it's pretty quick. I mean, um, basically I put in a wait for like half a second. So, um, I don't know. It takes a couple minutes to run through a uh, couple slash 24s. Um, so not, 
terribly long, but you know, it's one of those things like if you multi-thread it, it'll be a lot faster. Um, but uh, this is what it looks like. So in, in this in the screenshot here, we've got basically it uh, saying like, okay, so we have a, a new event log that um, needs to be created, um, and then it generates a list of IP addresses, attempts to uh, send an NBNS request uh, to the host at 192.168.018, and got a response for this this random host name. Um, and then uh, basically, if the uh, the event was or the, the event was written to the log, um, we can now go alert on that. And then uh, additionally, it submits the honey tokens. Um, and then on the responder side, this is kind of what you would see. So you know, if you're run, running responder on a network, this is this is the output that you're going to see. You're going to see like some some host. Like it could be like you know a land sweeper kind of thing where it's just hitting every host on the network. That's what this kind of would simulate, right? And then there's the event log. So. Um, yeah. Event logs. <laughs> so um, here's some references um, to a lot of the things we're talking about. Um, if you want to check some of these out, I mean, we like like I don't know. We we joke about it, but I mean, a lot of it's kind of like popsicle sticks for us. You know, we're we're we're, we're putting things together with popsicle sticks and duct tape, a yeah. bit of bailing wire, some yeah. gum. Yeah. Um, but the idea is that you know we we tend to be very successful. With all of these these attacks that, <laughs> with all these attacks that uh, we use on pretty much every pen test, and we wanted to try to help, like we decided to change hats for a minute, like I, and, and do like a blue team kind of thing, right? Um, so we're like, we're doing blue team. We're doing all these things that have worked for years for us, and um, and they still work. And so we wanted to try to help. We wanted to try to, you know, make a, a free open source solution. That would help people kind of implement this in their environments, um, and our, our goal is basically to have like this modular, modularized toolkit. So, like you saw, you know, uh, password auditing, password filter. Uh, you've got Kerberos detection. You've got um, you know uh, the responder guard and a couple of things. But we had like a list of things that we want to add, and I think what we're going to end up doing is just opening up uh, issues in the GitHub repo and you know have all these things that are I guess like on the want list um, for it, and uh, you know we. We hope that we can get some help with working on it. Um, I think we ran pretty quick through that. It's 30 minutes, Steve, so we definitely have time for questions, but yeah. So the question was for the uh, the list of passwords we use for password filtering. Basically, is there anything that you can't put in there? Um, the only uh, thing that I have in there that it that it'll uh, check for and not let you use is if the is if you try to use a uh, password that is less than four characters in that list, um, just as a safeguard, so you don't end up basically like not allowing <laughs> anybody to change their account. So you put in the letter A or you know AD or something like that. But other than that, uh, spaces all that should be fine. Should be and. You had a sorry. You had a second question as well. Yeah. Um, so the question is, is if you're running responder like on a Windows host, like would it generate too many alerts or too many logs? Oh, that's a good question. No, 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 because it'll only respond to uh, something that's a completely different host name than what's actually there. Um, so, like, it's it's sending all these random host names, saying, "Hey, are you this host on the network? Are you are you the the actual NetBIOS name?" Oh, that's actually so. That's a, I, something else I should mention is right now it just does NBNS. Um, I want to implement LLMR. I want to implement WPAD detection. Um, so, uh, you know, again, like, it's just trying to auth like not authenticate, but ask if the host. Is the, the actual IP address of the NetBIOS name directly, and if it says yes, then it's responding. Yeah. Jeff McJunkin. So the question was, uh, can you disable the Windows complexity requirement? Um, and still have it go through the password uh, filter process. That's a good question. Um, I believe so. I believe that it'll because it. Imp Let me pull up that graph back here. Go back, 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 back here. All right. Um, 
I believe, possibly. <laughs> I will say possibly, but I don't know for certain. So that would be an excellent thing to check. Excellent question. No. Next question. Push. Um, so when it outputs the result to the file, that is plain text. Um, but we could put in a feature to allow for redaction if, if you would like. Yep. Certainly. I, I like that idea and that would be an excellent feature to put in. Next question. Mr. Peterson. So the question was for the password filter, um, after you've implemented that and a user picks a password that they are not allowed to use, do they get a custom message? Right now, no. Basically what you'll get is you'll get the same message that says that you haven't met the complexity requirements. Um, that is something that we can change uh, and we'll definitely want to look into in, in the future, but it requires changing a different DLL on the domain controller. It's definitely something we'd love to implement, so great question. Uh, the question was, can, can we customize the message users get back? Uh, yes, we can, and we would like, love to do that at some point. Next question. I'm, I'm sorry, can you repeat that a little bit louder? Um, so the, the question was on does the, um, basically does the built-in complexity requirements have impl implications, using the built-in password complexity have implications for the password filter? Yes. Custom password objects? I'm sorry, I'm not, not familiar, so you guys know? Yeah, I'm not, not sure on that one. Oh, okay. So, that's right. Um, no, so it should be all of that, whatever you have built in, it'll still go through all those checks, all those things will be enforced. After the password has passed those checks that you have in place, then it goes through the password filter. So, and you can have multiple stages too. If you wanted, you could actually have multiple password filter programs um, for whatever reason if you'd like to. But yeah, it, it, it'll still go through all those stages. So that'll, that'll still be in place. Great question. Uh, next question. Uh, so the question was, have we deployed Elk in a large environment? I have not personally done that. I know of very large Elk installs. Uh, so from what I understand, when you outgrow uh, a regular sim or Splunk or something, you know, QRadar, uh, then you go to something like Elk. Uh, so Elasticsearch is uh, built to scale with commodity hardware. So, uh, you know, at, you know, it, it's, it's tough to, you know, have a lab and test scale, right? So, so the, the answer is no. Personally, I have not done it, but I have, I have heard of and known large installs. So, are there any more questions? These are all great questions. Yes. So I think, yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Hang on, you're talking about, oh, I went too far. You're talking about right here? Yeah, so um, on the, so again, even though we went through it quickly, uh, we were afraid that, you know, 
48 slides, 45 minutes, but we went kind of quick, right? Uh, so um, the question was uh, sending JSON from Windows Event Forwarder to uh, the Elk stack. So uh, what what we're using there is NX Log, which is a, a free utility, right? And then uh, so uh, in my blog post, I, I put the config files out that I'm using as gists, and you can just go grab them, modify them for for what you need. And I, I wrote the blog post, which should be out later. Uh, to be uh, really step by step, and so if anybody implements it and sees there's something wrong, because the the things that I found online about Windows Event Forwarder um, didn't really get me over the hump. I had to spend a day uh, piecing some things together from some different posts. Those posts were great, but I think they were just kind of you know, like dated for a previous you know Windows operating system build or something. And so there are a couple of things in how I ended up I, uh, putting it all together uh, that. Uh, that are in the blog post. So. Ah, yeah, so that's a good point. So um, uh, my colleague Joff uh, mentioned that, so earlier this year we did an uh, incident response on a shoestring budget talk. Uh, there was a webcast and a blog post on that uh, where we were, at, instead of Windows Event Forwarder, we were uh, deploying NX log to all of the endpoints and then shipping that to, to Elk Stack too. So there, there's various ways that you can go about it. I like the Windows Event Forwarder approach because it's not one more agent on your endpoints. I mean, some places, you know, deploying yet another agent is kind of a tough sell, right? So. Oh, yes. So it's different than the software stuff? Okay, yeah. Well, so there's a new one coming up then? Okay, cool. Yeah, so uh, Phil Hagen is a SANS instructor. He uh, is, uh, I guess, course author for uh, net, uh, the uh, for Forensics 572 uh, network uh, uh, forensics class, uh, released a thing called Soft Elk like uh, two years ago or so. So basically it's a VM with uh, an Elk stack pre-configured with lots of really awesome log stash filters in it. And so what John was just saying was, that a new one is coming out uh, very soon. So if you don't want to go through, I mean, the pain. I, I like setting things up, I guess, you know, years of open source software or something, I don't know. Uh, but if you just want a VM that that works, uh, you really you could get soft elk and probably just, you know, get the log stash filter, or maybe we could have fill just included, I don't know. Uh, and then you could just use that VM. So it's SOF-elk. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And so, you know, this does make our job harder too, right? So, you know. Yeah. Yeah, there's, yeah, instead, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so one one common thing at Black Hills is, uh, so we tend to, all the tools that we write, uh, we tend to put out for free. Um, if you call it John's talk earlier, uh, that's sort of how we roll, so. Are there, are there any more questions? And, and, and so if you think of something later, I mean, we'll be at the booth, we'll be around, so. Maybe the bar, so. Yeah. Thanks, thanks everyone.